Hi there, I'm Charlie, your online business manager and WordPress expert. My goal is to assist small to medium business owners build their businesses with a focus on using the internet and online technologies in an appropriate and cost-effective manner. People hire me to take the stress out of managing their businesses and allow themselves to focus on what they do best. Today, my guest is Jeremy Nagel. He's a neurodivergent, oh man, I knew I was going to do something there, (laughs) software developer turned startup founder. He told his startup smooth messenger he sold not told sorry guys he sold his startup smooth messenger to message media in 2022 and now works at message media as a project product manager his new startup focus bear is a productivity and work-life balance app for people with adhd and that's kind of why i wanted to have a chat to him not because i think we've all got adhd but because i think productivity and work-life balance is a really really important thing for business owners so jeremy thanks so much for joining us and sorry for the mess up on that intro no worries i think you actually said it all correct you're a divergent <laughs> spot on it's a difficult word to pronounce but great to be on the show well, thank you so much. So, look, why don't you give us a little bit more of an insight into who you are, the, the helicopter view, and then I've got some questions about things that were in that intro, and we can keep going from there. Sounds good. So to give a bit of backstory in terms of the businesses that I've had, Smooth Messenger was a business that grew out of a, a background that I had in Zoho Consulting. Soho, if you're not familiar with it, is a set of business apps. So they've got a CRM, they've got customer support, they've got a meeting product, they've got 65 different apps. It's very versatile. And when I started with it in 2011, it was very obscure. Not many people had heard of it. And now they have more than 100 million users, a billion dollars in revenue, one of the fastest growing CRMs out there. And it's quite a polished product compared to what it was like back then. But I, because I was using it relatively early on, I started getting gigs on Upwork, which is a freelancing marketplace for people who needed help with their CRM. And I progressively built up expertise in the Zoho suite. And I did a bit like what you're doing, Charlie, and trying to create some thought leadership and put some content out there, mainly on YouTube. I had a blog and I had a YouTube channel where I would make how-to videos and how-to blogs on how to do various things with Zoho CRM. And that ended up, even though it's not massive in terms of the number of subscribers, I have about 1,800 subscribers on YouTube. That's pretty good, actually. Yeah, well, it's nothing compared to, say, PewDiePie and some of the consumer YouTubers. But in a niche, that's actually a substantial number. And what I found was I'd go to Zoho conferences and people would recognize me from the videos. And I built up a, a bit of an authority in that way. And it meant that when I launched a product with Messenger, which was an SMS integration for Zoho CRM. And that product was based on basically people asking me to build an integration that I had done it five times for different customers. And then I realized, hang on, I'm building bespoke solutions. I could actually turn this into a product and give that to many people. And because I had some degree of reach within the Zoho community, it was able to get off the ground quite well that people were willing to try out the product because they appreciated the videos that I had made and the blog posts. And it ended up growing into a product with more than 500 businesses using it. Can't disclose revenue or anything like that, but it reached the point after launching in January 2020 I got approached in September 2021 by Message Media, which is a a large Australian SMS provider, and they wanted to have an integration into Zoho CRM. So we ended up negotiating for a while, and they purchased the business in February 2022. And now I'm working for them. Basically, product manager means mini CEO within their organization, where I, I look after what used to be my business and now is part of their suite of integrations. So it was a, a okay, wild journey. That, that's a hell of a journey. <laughs> um, hmm. So just so you know, I actually use Zoho. Um, I have Very been good. watching Zoho since 2010, 2011. So I know exactly what you mean about um, its journey into what it is today. Hmm. Um, and I only moved my business across to it fully, oh, November last year. 
Uh, so now I'm using this CRM and all of the all of the other products that go along with it and trying to work out how they work together. Hmm. Uh, so I'm definitely going to go and look for that YouTube channel you've got to see what your how to are. Um, and I was really, really glad to hear you talk about, uh, you know, 1,800 subscribers. You're right. It's not a lot in terms of a PewDiePie or the, the, bigger, the bigger channels, but it is a very, very niche channel. And I, I think that's something that business owners need to um, just take on board is that, your number of subscribers will relate to just how niche and how bespoke what you're doing is. So, yeah, 1,800 subscribers, that's massive for a, a how-to channel, a very a very specific how-to channel, I might add. <laughs> yeah, and, and also I'll add that my production quality was very low. I had an awful microphone for quite some time and people would often complain in the comments, fix your audio, you're typing so loud on your keyboard, it's painful to listen to. And that was part of why, I mean, there there are some other Zoho thought leaders or influencers on YouTube and they have maybe 5,000 subscribers and that's really a reflection of them putting in a bit more effort into the video quality. But I wanted to mention that, that it's, you don't need to be perfectionistic about it, that even though my videos were poor quality, I still had people reaching out, asking me to do consulting work because of a video that they had seen. And it was basically, I can tell that you know what you're doing because you did it in the video. I don't have time to do it myself. Can you do it for me? I'll pay you to do it. And that's probably Fantastic. a good model to consider that there might be a concern that say with what you're doing, that if you record a video on how to set up WordPress, that people might, the concern might be, oh, but then people will just do it on their own. But people often don't. Is that your mentality as well? Oh, so very much. Look, my my whole mentality is um, I like to empower people to be able to do it themselves. I'd like them to know what's involved in doing something and if they want to go and do it themselves all power to them um as a, a business coach and someone who talks to businesses though i say to them where's where's your knitting where does your where does your money come from because it's not from you setting up all these apps you mm -hmm. should have people like me doing this sort of work so you can go and focus on what brings your money in but all power to them if they want to go and do it themselves that's fine and yes, that's where I get a lot of my work from too, is like people look at what I've done and go, oh, you know what you're doing, you can just go do this for us. Hmm. Yeah. Now, um, can you just tell us a little bit, because uh, some of my audience is a little bit older, what neurodivergent actually means? Sure. Neurodivergent is a term to describe a person who whose brain works a bit differently it incorporates a number of different conditions, including autism and ADHD, which are some of the, the highest prevalence ones. Also dyslexia. And then there are some ones that people might not be feel familiar with, like dyspraxia, which is issues with coordination and speech. And then there's also, say, Down syndrome. Mental health conditions are also included. So anxiety, depression, and even neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's are incorporated too. It's quite a large umbrella. So it includes 15 to 20% of the population would be classified as neurodivergent, meaning that their brains are different from the typical brain. Right. Okay. So um, I sometimes say you think differently. Um, mm. And that that sometimes uh, you can you 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 might classify yourself in there. So I just wanted people to understand what that meant because it's a new term, and some of us older people don't really understand it. So thank you for that. Mm. Um, can I also add that there's a tendency to view it as a, a negative, and in some cases it can be purely a negative. But there are also generally positive aspects to each of those types of brain. So, for example, the ADHD brain tends to be an entrepreneurial brain that tends to be a lot of ideas that spin out. And the autistic brain tends to be a brain that is very good at detail and going deep on certain technical and topics. following process. They like to follow process. They like to have things mapped out. And yeah. yes, look, it is a it is actually a positive um, in in most cases. Uh, the way I also like to think about it is, if you understand how someone thinks and how their brain works, you can then work out how to work with them best. Um, yeah, you know, you you wouldn't say 
to someone who is um, autistic, oh, look, um, just just go work it out. <laughs> just look, here's, here, here it is, just, just to go be creative. You need to give them some really strong guidelines and say, here's where I want you to go. Someone with ADHD, you might just be able to say, yeah, work it out. You're good. <laughs> I don't care how you do it. Just give me a result. Um, so it's 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 actually a really good way of understanding the people that you're working with, your own team members, your own staff, even yourself sometimes and how you can manage yourself. Yeah, uh, and all, they all tend to be spectrums as well that autism, everyone knows there's a spectrum there, but even ADHD, there's a, a spectrum associated with that in terms of hyperactivity and inattentiveness. And most people, well, everyone is going to be somewhere on the spectrum. So even if you're not formally diagnosed with ADHD, for example, I think there are some universal principles that align that most people, I think, want to know the reason behind their work, that if you just tell someone, do this, and you don't tell them why, especially someone with ADHD like me, I I just won't do the task because I'll, I'll think, okay, you've told me it, you haven't given me a deadline. I assume it's not important. So I'm going to focus on the things that I have identified as important. Whereas if you tell me, hey, Jeremy, this customer is worth five grand per month. They're the biggest customer we have. We really need to fix this bug for them and they're going to be launching next week. That's going to go way up high in my priority list. But if you just tell me, hey, there's this problem where one of the SMS doesn't send out correctly and I don't have any further context, I'm not going to fix it. Yeah. For me, that that's extreme. For my, for other people, maybe they'll still do it, but they won't be as enthusiastic as if you fill in the context. So I think it's helpful in generally trying to tailor communication in a way that's going to help people. But also generally people like to know why and they like to have some understanding of the granularity of it. And then some people will want more granularity in terms of what yep. you were saying about autistic people might want to know a lot of specifics. Absolutely. And I was just sort of, I'm just sort of laughing because I'm very much that, yes, I want to know why we're doing it, but just give me the dot points. Give me all the detail that I can find later and go through, but just give me the dot points. Tell me mm -hmm. what I need to do. Give me the dot points and let me go. Mm -hmm. And that that causes a lot of people trouble because I'm like, I don't, too, much, too many details. I've tuned out now. I'm gone. Bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, some people need all that detail. That That's just the way they think. So thank you for that. That's great. And that's some really good advice just for business owners and um, employers in general. Um, so uh, there was a couple of things you said you could talk about, and I, I really liked your idea. One of the things that you came up with was um, how, as a business owner, you can um, use the tools that you've, you've, you've developed here um, and your application about creating positive habits uh, when you're trying to work with you know, a lack of focus. If you're not, if you're not neurodivergent, it's a lack of focus or potentially it's not even, you don't, you just don't have a lot of time. You've got a lot of things going on. You've got to get things sorted out. So I think if we can sort of head down that path, but why don't you tell us a little bit about your new startup, Focus Bear, um, and how that works and then perhaps lead that into how that, how other people can use it, how people can use it. Yeah, sure. Focus Fair was an app that I developed for myself because I've got ADHD and autism myself. And the impetus for developing it was throughout the, the sale of Smooth Messenger, it was a tremendously stressful time for me because I still had to run the business and I was worried about results potentially declining if I diverted my focus onto all of the due diligence information that I had to provide. And then I was negotiating with message media. I was dealing with accountants and lawyers, and I also had a, another job as well. So I was stretched very thin and I was noticing that I was becoming more irritable and I was actually becoming less productive because I wasn't sleeping enough. I was waking up at 5 a.m. to deal with US customers and then staying up until 10 p.m. to deal with UK customers. And then I also wasn't exercising and I wasn't meditating things that actually helped me to be able to cope with stress and to be productive. And I recognized that I needed to interrupt this cycle where I was waking up first thing and I was going straight to my computer because I was concerned that something bad might have happened overnight while I wasn't working. 
and that my team might have tried to contact me and maybe I didn't hear the phone ring. So it was a, a very, it, there was reason for that because there, there had actually been multiple times where servers had melted down at 3 a.m. and the team had called me and I'd had to go and fight those fires. But it leads to a not a very healthy attitude where I was starting to wake up with a sense of dread and I'd go straight to the computer, even though most of the time, maybe there was a, a little fire, but it, it actually could have waited until 9am. I didn't need to deal with it first thing, but I couldn't seem to actually will myself to not check emails, but instead go for a walk, do some journaling, meditate, get myself into a good headspace to be able to deal with the stress of the day. And so I wanted an app that would basically block me from my emails until I had done some of those positive habits first thing. So I got someone to to build it for me. I, I come from a software developer background, but I didn't have time to build it myself. So I had someone else do the initial prototype and it started working really well for me. I just did 10 minutes in the morning at, to start off with where I would go for a five minute run which is ridiculous because I'm barely out of the door before I have to come back and five minutes of meditation. But I really, I wanted to follow the philosophy of Tiny Habits, which is a book by an American researcher, BJ Fogg, where he finds that in order to build up an uh, impressive habit, like say doing half an hour of running each day, you actually have to start with something smaller and focus on doing it every day, building it up over time. I really liked that approach and I started following it where I began with that 10 minute morning routine where I was just dealing with my nerves and telling myself it's okay. The world isn't going to burn down if I wait 10 minutes before I check my emails. And then gradually as my comfort increased and I had evidence showing me that nothing bad had happened with 10 minutes, I made it 11 minutes the next week and then 12 and gradually built it up over time where now I do a two hour morning routine and it's fine. And I've, I've helped empower my team so that they can handle things on their own. And I've also given myself evidence that even if they do need help, they can normally wait two hours. Okay. So you've said a whole heap of things there and I don't know if you noticed me smiling and nodding all, along the way, but um, oh yeah, I, I that, is a trap that so many of us fall into is we get so tied up in working in our business. We forget that we've got to work on our business and on ourselves. Mm. Um, and I, I, I fall into that habit. I'll, I'll get up some mornings. I'll, I'm just straight at the desk and that's it. You know, I haven't gone for my walk. I haven't had my cup of tea. I haven't walked the dogs. I haven't said hello to dad. I haven't I haven't spoken to anyone. And then get to the end of the day, and I hate the day. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm like, oh, I've just got to do this all again tomorrow. And that that's rubbish. I was going to say I was going to say a much worse word there, but ah. that's rubbish. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah, that, that, that's a- absolute rubbish. And it's a really good way to train yourself to do it. So, Tiny Habits is the name of the book. It's mm. something I'm going to go and have a look up. Hmm. Because that sounds like a a really good thing. Um, Now, you also talked about empowering your team. Um, And uh, can you just explain a little bit how you did that, Um, if you you know, or was it just one of the things that occurred as a part of all of this? Yeah. In the team that I work with, they're mainly software developers, so it's a, a bit specific to them, but maybe we can extrapolate to other people that might be in the team. But basically, one of the things that I told them is that if there is a problem late at night, and I've got someone in North America who monitors emails overnight, and I basically, I empowered Francisco, who's the guy in El Salvador who monitors the emails. And I I said, if there's a fire, you can call me, but first talk to the developers. And I told the developers, if there's a fire, try and solve it yourself. And if you can't figure it out, then you can call me. And just by having that communication, I mean, it it seems very obvious, but it wasn't really happening in the past that if there was a problem, Francisco probably wouldn't actually talk to them and the developers would have felt scared to solve it on their own. They might have tried to come up with a solution, but they wouldn't actually deploy it live. Whereas now I, I gave them a little bit more freedom, even though... 
I mean, there's a risk in that because they could actually make the problem worse. But what you were saying before about the the difference between working in the business and working on the business, I think that's really key that if I remain the person who is the firefighter and I never give them the chance to fail and they might screw it up, that they might also learn a lot in the process. And now they're much better at solving those issues than I am because they, I mean, I, I shouldn't really be writing code like you were saying before with that choice of where is the knitting and the knitting for me isn't in writing code anymore. It's really in figuring out what should we be, be building next, coming up with the strategy and I can't do that if I'm tired and if I'm deep in the detail. I actually have better strategic ideas when I go for my walk or go for my run or do my meditation. I have to keep a piece of paper and pen handy at all times because I'll often have inspiration while I'm away from my desk and they tend to be the best ideas. Whereas if I'm constantly working, I just do incremental change rather than seeing the real root cause of the problem. Oh, you know, I'm I'm nodding at that one. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've sat here trying to troubleshoot something and gone, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I'm just going to go and get a cup of coffee. I'm going to go for a walk and I come back and I look at it and go, oh, there it is. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> and you feel very sheepish because it's been staring you at, it's staring you in the face, but mm. you're so deep into it. You're so involved in it. You're not seeing it. So mm. being able to step out, and I think that's what really what you're talking about, is being able to step out take a deep breath um, and work your way through it again or come back and look at it with fresh eyes makes such a difference. Um, mm. And so that that's really great. Um, so we can extrapolate your little, your, your, your example there. I was going to see a little example, but that's a really big example. Um, basically you told your people that it was okay for them to do something. So many people are so scared to try and do something because it's your baby, it's your business, it's your it's your thing, and they don't want to touch it because they might break it. And simply by saying, here is the guidelines as to how far you can go before you have to seek permission, um, uh, yeah, I would rather you seek forgiveness than ask permission <laughs> because you do learn. Um I would also suggest that you probably ended up with some written down processes and policies that people could look at and say, yeah, okay, we can do that or no, we can't. I'm looking, seeing if you're going to say yes to that one. <laughs> we, we, we did have a few checklists that we added, but I think that that has been a, a weakness of mine that I haven't been great at business policy documentation, <laughs> something I'm trying to get better at now. But checklists are, I mean, checklists are just as good. It's like, have you done this? Have you done this? Have you done this? Well, the next step is call the boss hmm. um, or call the developer or, I don't know, turn the servers off, go home. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so th that's fantastic. So let's talk about your app then. So you're talking, how, how does the app actually work? Because you've got me interested now. <laughs> so it's a both a desktop and a mobile app. And the idea is that when I wake up, I want to do my morning routine. That's one part of it, that it will make it harder for me to access my emails. It's still possible for me to get to them if there is an emergency, but it will make me wait for a 15 second countdown timer and it will try and guilt trip me and say, are you sure you need to be doing this right now? Or can you actually go back and do your habits first? So that that's one part of it, of doing the morning routine. And that's been very helpful for me in getting me into a good headspace before I start the day. The other side of it is blocking distractions during the day. So on both the phone and the computer, I had a bad habit of going and checking the news quite frequently throughout the day. I'd reach a point where I was feeling like my work was a little bit difficult and I wasn't enjoying it. And I'd have this thought in the back of my mind, oh, I wonder what's happening in Ukraine right now, or I wonder what whether there was an earthquake today and I'd go and check the headlines and I'd lose 25 minutes and I'd lose the the flow that I had before. So now if I go to a news website, it just blocks it for me because I've marked those websites as something that I shouldn't be doing during <laughs> work hours. I can access them later in the day after I've finished my work day, but 9am to 5pm or basically midnight to 5pm I don't want to have access to them. 
and it'll block them automatically. And then there's also other websites where I haven't necessarily identified them as being distracting. I haven't written them down as being really bad, but sometimes I'll be intending, for example, to write a report and then there'll be something in a a page that I'm looking at that's relevant and there's this intriguing link and I decide to click on it and that can often be where I get distracted. I'll go down a rabbit hole. So we've got an AI feature where it will look at that link that I just opened and it will look at what I said that I wanted to do. I said I wanted to write a report. So why am I going to look up the grand final scores right now? That doesn't seem relevant. <laughs> so the, the AI is pretty good there at, at deciding, is this relevant? Is it not? And then it will do a pop-up saying, are you sure you need to use this right now? It doesn't seem to be relevant. So this is something that you customise, obviously, and you customise it for yourself and your own work habits. Yeah, and it learns the way that you work over time. So as you start using it, it will ask you, is this website productive? And you say yes, and then it will remember that and it won't ask you next time. So within about a week, it's got a pretty good handle on what constitutes productivity for you and what is distracting. And then it will help you keep within those guardrails. So what I'm hearing here is you have to be brutally honest with yourself as well when a link comes up and you're asked that question and not say, oh, yeah, it is productive. I'm, I'm scrolling Facebook because I'm doing research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let, let's talk a little bit about creating habits because uh, that that's a really good one. I, I liked that and I really loved your idea of a five-minute run Um I actually just just a, a slight anecdote on that. I I, I was dramatically unfit <laughs> um, about uh, twelve months ago, actually, um, and even sort of getting up and walking a hundred meters was like a real challenge. <laughs> like it was something I avoided at all costs. Like I'm oh, just no, I'm not doing it. Um, so small habits. I did 50 metres and then I did 100 mm. and then I did 200. Um, and in the morning what I'd do is I'd get up and I'd do that 50 metres first of all and walk out and walk back and, okay, I've done my exercise for the day. That's it. Now I'm doing two or three or four kilometres at a time without even thinking about it. It's mm. it's easy now. So tiny habits do build into bigger ones, but if you could just uh, go through a little bit more and um, perhaps give us some analogies as to how business owners might use that. Yeah, sure. So the the habit that is business related that I'll talk about is content creation. So I found that I used to be very inconsistent with that, that I'd have days of inspiration where I would churn out, say, five videos in one day. And then for the next three weeks, I did nothing. And what I wanted to do was to make it something that I did every day. So that, that that's a habit that I now, now have in my morning routine, that as part of my focus board, focus bear routine. I go for my run, I do my meditation, and then I have some habits that are content related. So I'll have 20 minutes of either writing or editing blog posts. I've got writers that help and a, an AI tool that helps, but I need to actually go through it and make sure the content is relevant and ready to be published on our website. And it's not necessarily a particularly fun task. It, it can be a bit boring going through and, and editing and and reading it. And it's something that is easy for me to postpone because it doesn't feel urgent. If I don't do it, then nothing bad happens right away. But I found that by doing it on a daily basis, I actually make tremendous progress. So I've been working on a book as well as another content creation habit. And I do, I started with five minutes every day and I was able to to make some progress with that. I've now gradually increased it to 10 minutes per day. I've been doing that consistently for close to six months, I think. I'm now up to 30,000 words that I've written, just doing 10 minutes per day consistently. That's and, impressive. That's really impressive. And it feels easy. It's a bit like your analogy with the walking, that if you had gone straight to walking four kilometres per day, it would have been impossible or something that you might do once in a month. But because you built up to it over time, it was it was feasible. And that's the same thing with content that maybe right now you only have five minutes at five minutes, you can actually achieve something. If you even do a plan 
for five minutes. One day you do a plan for the next article. The next day you write some headlines. The day after that, you fill out the first paragraph and within a week, you'll probably have a blog post finished. Yeah. I, I, so I, I just want to sort of, one of the things that came up there was um, you write the headlines and then you write your outline, dot point it, and then just mm. start, um, you know, okay, today I'm going to do this dot point and I'm going to do a paragraph or two paragraphs on this dot point. And then mm. when you're up to doing 20 minutes, you're probably doing three or four dot points at a time, leave it, come back the next day and do the next bit. That That's a really great piece of advice, Jeremy. Hmm. fantastic piece of advice yeah and the the other one related to that is a quote attributed potentially to oscar wilde which is that when he would write he would finish his writing mid-sentence so that it's easier for him to go back to it the next day and that's something that i do (laughs) you don't like that i don't know i could do that (laughs) i'd come back and go what the hell was i writing (laughs) (laughs) i quite like it because I'm going to try it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, when the timer goes off for me, because I have it within Focus Spare, there's a timer, and then it just blocks that that tab at that point. So I I can't write more if <laughs> even if I want to. It'll close that Google Doc that I had open, and then it's oh, wow. very easy for me to to go back the next day because I it, there's the momentum of where I was going next. Whereas if I had finished a whole paragraph, then the next day it feels harder because I have to think about what am I going to write next? Where are you up to next? Too? Yeah, mm. yeah, that I that I do get, that I absolutely understand. Okay, so how do people find out a little bit more about you? How can people contact you? Uh, and what sort of work do you do with people? Um, let's talk about Focus Bear or whatever, whatever comes to mind for you there. Sure. LinkedIn is the best way to get in touch. And I, I don't do consulting or coaching or anything like that. But if you want to have a chat, happy to to talk about productivity or distractions. And I'd really love if people wanted to try out something to help with focus and work-life balance. I'd love your feedback on Focus Bear. And the website for Focus Bear is focusbear.io. I will have all of um, Jeremy's contact details in the show notes. So just check down below when when you're watching or maybe above depends on where you're looking at this <laughs> um as for, for the notes um and definitely reach out and have a chat to him uh i actually want to invite you all to come and join my locals community ask charlieletham.locals.com being a business owner can be tough being a business owner who works remotely can get lonely and frustrating I want my locals community to be a bit like the old water cooler of old. So, yeah, we're talking about a few distractions there. Um, I want you to treat my community as a place where you not only get to interact with me but with each other. You can gain inspiration from others. You can provide inspiration to others. And, of course, there's advice and just general chit-chat. As subscribers to my local community, you'll also be able to ask questions of myself. So come along and join me at askcharlieletham.locals.com. Okay, back to us now. Now that was my throw. There we go. <laughs> I wanted to ask more about the locals community. I haven't heard of that platform before. Is it, it, it sounds like it would involve in-person meetups as well, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, it was actually, it's actually, um, well, sorry, let me rephrase it. It can do if you want it to. Okay. Um, it can be for the lo- like your, your local group. Um, I'm actually uh, connected with a couple of groups on there that are all in North America or um, the UK. Hmm. Uh, and it's like a closed Facebook group. Um, so locals.com is, is the platform. Hmm. And then you create your community in there and it is its own self-contained community. Uh, there is, you know how when you go to Facebook and you just get, everyone's rubbish Mm. i'm sorry guys i'm sorry i love you all i really do love you all (laughs) but um you know you just get all the stuff in the feed and you can't find what you're looking for and you're looking for someone specific to talk to or you go to um or you've got to go and then join facebook to go and join one of the groups so that you can interact there and then when you join facebook i've got a thing i've got a little bit of a thing about facebook and all the information they want you to give and all of the um um censorship that they do and uh, just annoys me um locals 
I came out of the fact that there was a number of people who said, we, we just don't want the advertising. We just don't want the censorship. We just don't want to have to worry about, are we going to bre breach a community guideline by saying something that we think is actually quite reasonable. Most people think is actually quite reasonable, but one person gets there gets upset i was going to use another term there mm -hmm. um <laughs> um gets upset and you know pings you and then your community shut down and you've just lost all of that so that's mm -hmm. what locals is about it's about taking that that group and giving yourself a closed user group where people can come and interact um you can like my community is free yeah, uh, there is a paid tier. So if you do it once I get paid subscribers, there'll be content for paid subscribers that only paid subscribers can look at. Um, it's a way to get donations. So you know, if you're doing a lot of lot of our sort of stuff and you want people to instead of going having a buy me a buy me a coffee type thing, they can come there and give you a tip. Hmm. Um, cool. <laughs> um I, I like it. it. It's and it's different enough that and it's um light enough in terms of its requirements that I, I don't feel like I'm going to trip over anything by by messing up <laughs> saying mm. something I shouldn't <laughs> cool. so it's worthwhile having a look at and if people want to know more about it ping me um or come and join me over there and I'll be happily run you through it mm. um so Jeremy what's one thing that you'd like people to take away from our conversation today the concept of actually stepping away from the work for a bit. I think that's the key realization that I've had recently that I'd like other people to adopt as well, which is that actually working a hundred hour weeks may be less productive than work working 40 hour weeks and having time to look after myself, get enough sleep, have time with my wife, have time to do some hobbies as well. And those are the moments when I end up having the ideas that really have driven the business forward. And it feels counterintuitive, but it has really helped me and helped move things forward. I think that is wonderful advice. I really do. Um, and I think we all should take that to heart and go and practice it ourselves. Um, don't work 100 hours a week if you can avoid it. Give mm. yourself time to breathe. Give your brain time to process what's going on. Not only will you sleep better, you'll feel better and you'll be more productive. Yeah. And I think having the constraint really helps because without a constraint, I'll start doing my website and I'll be doing all of these jobs that other people can actually do for me. Whereas if there's a constraint on the number of hours, then it means I have to figure out who can do the website I'm not using WordPress, unfortunately. I'm using Webflow, but I've got someone who is much better than me at doing the website. I, I love the results that he gets. And the same thing with many aspects of my business that by me stepping back a bit and having those constraints, it has allowed other people to, to step up and do better jobs than I could have. Uh, look, I, I, lo I love hearing you say that. I really do. It's so refreshing to hear it um, because we all fall into that trap. Absolutely. Um, and once you get to that point where you can say, that's okay, I have Gail. Everyone needs a Gail. <laughs> <laughs> I have Gail and I've got Gail. She answers my phones and she looks at my email for me. And if there's something that I haven't seen or I need to address, she'll message me on one of our little back channels and say, have you seen this? Is this something you need to worry about? Is there something I need to go back and say? Or she'll just go back and say, hey, listen, she's busy at the moment. Um, we'll be in touch in a day or so. And give people that that feedback as to when 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 I'll be in touch or what we'll be doing. So everyone mm. needs a gale in their life. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> All right. Look, guys, um, Jeremy, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we close up on, on this one on today? No, I'd wish everyone all the best with their own business journey and I'll have to check out Locals as well. Your community sounds Fantastic. excellent. Look, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it and thank you for being so candid and sharing so much great information. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone to like this video, subscribe to my channel and ring the notification bell so you know when more content drops. And apart from that, have a fantastic week, guys. Thanks.